Okay, it's five past 12, so I think um, now's a good time to start. People will um, continue to join uh, during the meeting, so um, welcome to everyone now, though. Um, this roundtable, the second of our Climate Action Roundtables, um, focuses on energy auditing. And energy auditing, um, most of you will have um, varying amounts of um, knowledge and awareness of, but it's basically a process for identifying and getting some information about um, the opportunities to reduce electricity use or energy use more broadly in your in your building. Um, it's really important when um, I speak to a lot of um, OSLSA members, um, first, especially when they first start, the questions are, well, you know, where do we start saving energy? And, and an energy audit um, and the process of, of procuring an energy audit and acting on an energy audit are a big part of that. So, um, so just a little bit of housekeeping to get started. Um, once again, we're sitting on MS um, Teams. Most of you have your um, cameras and microphones turned off. When we start um, the questioning, the questions part of the um, presentation, we'll um, we'll open those up for you so you can ask questions and interact interact with us there. Um, so we and at the end of the session, we will have time. So the general process is that we. Um, We'll spend about 25 minutes to half an hour having a presentation from our two presenters. Uh, um, and that, no doubt, will lead to lots of questions and interesting discussion, which will happen after that. Um, just remember that you've got opportunity to use your chat and reaction functions during the um, talk. Um, so please um, use those freely. Also, um, just be aware that we are recording this presentation. That's purely for the p purposes of sharing it um, not outside this group, but with people who may have um, registered for this event, but haven't been able to make it today. And, and for yourselves also to reflect back on the presentation and share it internally in your teams. We will be stopping, um, or we won't be circulating that recording um, once questions start. That's a bit of a trade-off. Obviously there's some inf interesting information in the question time, but um, in the interests of people feeling free to ask whatever questions or make whatever comments they want to make, um, we won't um, be circulating that recording after that. Um, but I would also like to start um, by saying that in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, we'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eura Nation in Sydney and the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're conducting the webinar today um, and recognise the continuation of the cultural and spiritual and the educational connection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to their lands. Um, we pay the, our respects to their elders past and present and also extend that respect to the any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce to you today to our two special guests. Um, both um, Holly and Vic work for the Energy Efficiency Council. Holly is the head of projects and uh, Victoria is a senior project officer with the Energy Efficiency Council. The Energy Efficiency Council, um, amongst other things, promote um, energy management as a tool to, to help organisations to transition into an affordable and reliable energy system and progress into a net zero economy. Um, Holly has worked internationally with both private and public sector clients um, on innovative solutions to tackle climate change. Both in Europe, she worked for the UN um, CDP and an organisation called Salix Finance, where she worked with councils facilitating the development and delivery of energy efficiency and carbon management plans through energy upgrades. Uh, and Vic most recently worked um, as an in an environmental NGO advocating for sustainable energy investment decisions to support a just transition to a decarbonised economy. Prior to this, she worked at um, BlackRock in New York City as a strategy analyst um, uh, before moving to Australia to pursue her postgraduate studies at the University of Melbourne, where she completed a Master of Environment with a special Oh, um, specialisation in climate change policy and governance. So well, thank you first of all very much for making your time available, Holly and Vic. Um, I'll hand over to you. We're very interested to um, to get the uh, get the inside um, inside no the knowledge on uh, and word on energy audits. Thanks so much for having us, Richard. We're uh, pretty happy to be here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so with that in mind, I might just share my screen so that everyone can see what we're here to talk about. Uh, would I be correct, Richard, that the screen is visible? Yes, you are on the air. Perfect. We're, we can use technology two years into a pandemic. It's a real <laughs> win. Um, so as Richard has just noted, uh, Vic and I work for the Energy Efficiency Council. So the Energy Efficiency Council is Australia's peak body for energy management products and services providers, which basically means that we exist to build the market for those products and services. Uh, of course, neither of us feel bad about that because energy efficiency and energy management saves businesses and households money. So it's a real win-win for everyone. Uh, like Richard, I'd really like to respectfully acknowledge the, tra the traditional owners of the land on which Vic and I are currently located, which is the Boonarong, Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So before we get started, uh, effectively just a bit of background. Uh, Vic has been with us for six months and has definitely become an expert on tax incentives, which is basically going to build the business case for your energy audits, whereas I've been uh, with the EEC for about four years now and have been spending that time talking with uh, groups like all of you about the opportunities around energy management with supporting net zero goals and indeed reducing energy costs, which is particularly pertinent at the moment, given how much electricity and gas prices have shot up in the last couple of months following both uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also just general shortages with the gas and coal in Australia and around the world. So what are we here to talk about today? Obviously the what, why and how of us office energy audits. But before we get into that, we want to give you a bit of background. So Vic's going to give, give everyone a bit of context around what's driving net zero. Now, I'm sure everyone's broadly across this, but there's some key stats which really hammer at home. So Vic's going to go into a bit of detail around that. Um, we're then going to go into a bit more detail about the role of energy management, which isn't just energy efficiency. It's also demand flexibility and on-site renewables and indeed your procurement in supporting office-based businesses and indeed your legal firms with achieving net zero. We're then going to go into a little bit more detail about how energy audits work and how you can utilise them to make the business case for energy management initiatives. And then we're going to round it out with Vic giving a bit of context on the time limited full expensing measure, which is a tax depreciation incentive currently offered by the Commonwealth Government, which will end at the end of next financial year. So we've got 13 months left and that's particularly useful for boosting the business case for energy upgrades. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Vic so she can talk to us about what's driving net zero. Awesome. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, and thank you so much uh, for inviting us to come and speak today. It's lovely to be able to kind of share all the work that we're doing and um, all the initiatives that we're trying to explain to people that are available to them in order to help folks manage their energy, reduce costs, reduce emissions. Um, and it's really important to speak to a variety of industries. So the fact that um, you guys from the legal sector are interested in learning about this is, is really, really great, and very encouraging, uh, just to show that this is an economy wide and a culture wide phenomenon. Um, so since you guys have all signed up for this organization and have you know, willingly come to this climate action roundtable. I'm sure you're across net zero initiatives and the reasons that why we would want to drive to net zero. Um, but we'll just quickly go through where the emissions are coming from in Australia so that we can understand where we need to focus in order to get to that net zero emissions target. Um, so net zero, as you are all well across, means achieving an overall balance of greenhouse gas emissions produced and then greenhouse gas emissions that are removed from the atmosphere. Um, so in order to understand how to drive to net zero, we need to know where the emissions are coming from. So as you can see on this chart, a large amount, a, the 
the largest amount of Australia's emissions are coming from the energy sector. So that's related to fossil fuel combustion in buildings, industry and transport, and another 10% from fugitive emissions. That brings us up to 80% of Australia's emissions that are directly linked to the energy industry. Uh, so that's why we really focus on energy and energy management, energy reduction um, and smart energy usage as the, the first step to achieving a net zero goal. Um, in, in addition, the buildings specifically, and so the office space buildings, um, do attribute about um, over, I think it's about a quarter of Australia's emissions when you think about construction, energy use, and all the involved Overall emissions. Overall buildings in Australia, so that includes residential and commercial, uh, contribute about a quarter of Australia's emissions, which is actually quite substantial when yes. you think about it. Um, so, even you know, um, thinking about the the impacts of the energy that you're using within your offices does make a, a big difference in terms of um, addressing the emissions reductions that are required across the economy, especially because these are areas that are a bit easier to to abate as opposed to some of these other areas of the economy that are going to require more time to to get to the point where we can have net zero emissions from them. Um, so, what's driving the net zero? transformation that we're seeing right now is a bunch of uh, commitments that are coming from institutions across the public and private sector, um, as well as the pressure that's coming from communities, consumers um, in Australia and globally. So the first thing to note is that 100% of state and territory governments, um, as well as the uh, the federal government in Australia have committed to net zero targets by 2050. Um, they all also have interim targets for emissions reduction by 2030. Um, the Labour government that's just been elected in is obviously their emissions reduction target is um, a bit more uh, aggressive than the, the previous government's target. So that's a 43% reduction by 2030. And then um, all of the other states bar Queensland have a emissions reduction target of uh, about 50% by, by 2030. Um, and also 91 out of uh, 91 local government areas have individually committed to net zero as well. So it's coming from across the entire range of um, local government um, up to federal government institutions. Um, consumers are also very much driving this demand. Um, there's 67% uh, of Australians that were surveyed are supportive of action on climate change, um, with 48% um, supporting climate change because the benefits outweigh the cost. So there is a willingness for an investment in, in things that can reduce emissions and can benefit the um, overall climate change um, uh, mitigation, even if there is a, a short term additional cost on top of that. Um, and in addition, almost 70% do think that meaningful action will deliver long term economic benefits. So there's definitely a huge push from from consumers. Um, and then investor pressure as well. So the IGCC, um, the investor group on climate change, there you go. Um, which represents views of Australian and New Zealand, New Zealand investors um, representing about three trillion Australian dollars in assets. Uh, Forty percent of them are advocating for um, uh, have made portfolio wide commitments to net zero emissions by 2050, and that's an increase from 27 percent in 2020. So you can just see year after year these commitments are are growing substantially and the interest and appetite for emission reductions. Um, 38% of uh, suppliers, so within supply chains, 38% of suppliers are engaging um, with their own, uh, suppliers are engaging with their own suppliers. Um, so across the entire supply chain to ensure that they're working with businesses that are also decarbonizing um, their, their products and their processes. So it's not just within each individual business, um, it's everyone that's being partnered with across the entire supply chain and the value chain. Um, and then the number of ASX 200 companies with net zero goals has just been skyrocketing. Um, so we can see these big commitments coming from uh, larger institutions. So in uh, 2020, there was 14 of the ASX 200 companies that had committed to it. In March 2021, that jumped up to 49. And then by the end of 2021, it was 72 companies. So the announcements are continuing to come thick and fast. Um, and the Business Council of Australia has joined um, these, this, this 
chorus of voices calling not just for net zero emissions um, by 2050, but interim targets that are more ambitious for 2030 and more realistic pathways to get to that net zero emissions target. Um, so now I will turn it over to Holly to talk about how energy management can really drive the emissions reductions goals in office based businesses and talk about the energy audit aspect as well. Awesome. Thanks, Vic. I think it's probably worthwhile noting that effectively every way you look, there are calls for reaching net zero. And the question now is, well, how do we actually get to net zero? Well, the good news is, is in Australia, we have a handy dandy framework for that called Climate Active. So this is a Commonwealth government program, which basically sets out carbon neutral principles and how your business can reach carbon neutrality, which will support Australia's achievement of net zero. So really importantly, the principles for achieving net zero sit with reduce emissions first and then offset whatever you can't reduce. So it's reduce, 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 and you do that with energy efficiency upgrades. You do that by switching your electricity to green power to renewables, and you do that by electrifying your gas processes. Now, because all of you are office-based businesses, legal firms aren't running manufacturing sites that need high temperature, Everything that's in your building can be electrified. It's commercially viable right now and available. So the opportunity to put in energy efficiency to reduce your emissions, switch over to electric processes, and then purchase green power for everything will get rid of, in an office-based business, often more than 80% of your overall emissions. And then you would just offset the rest until such time that there is an opportunity for you to not need to offset, but to be able to reduce those emissions in other ways. So that's really key to of, of how to think about that. So with that in mind, how do you actually identify energy management opportunities? Well, we talk about three steps and this is a little bit back to back to front. So if you start at the bottom, it talks about starting with what can be seen. And that is putting solar PV on your roof if you've got that opportunity. But more importantly, it's checking that your lights have changed over to LED lights. So really simple stuff that just involves you walking around your site and looking for opportunities, which could be, uh, you know, a fridge seal is no longer working and that'll cost you 20 bucks at Bunnings to fix. The second piece is benchmarking energy performance with a neighbor's energy rating. And the third piece is adopting energy management as a discipline. So to give you a bit of a, bit of a feel for what that means, when we're starting with what can be seen to achieve quick wins, I appreciate that if you guys know what you're doing, you've probably already changed your lights to LED. But we actually did a study of city switch signatories, which are businesses that have committed to improving their sustainability. And a third of tenants had not upgraded their lighting to LED. The difference in energy consumption between LED versus an incandescent is quite substantial. And it's an easy thing that you can do with very limited help. Indeed, depending on the size of your office and OHS, you might be able to change the lights yourself. So really just walking around your office and saying, what are the huge opportunities? Do you have old desktop computers that you could flip over to laptops, which you'll use about a third less energy? Some of these things are really big opportunities. Repeating again, looking at things like your fridge to see if the seal's broken. Of course, this applies at home as well, but the sheer amount of electricity that can be wasted by a fridge not closing properly is quite substantial. So thinking about those really easy, quick, simple opportunities, which also can be turning off the lights when you leave at the end of the day or adjusting the heating and cooling so that in winter time you're set to 22 rather than set to 24 and in summertime you're set to 24 rather than 22. So it's really thinking about that opportunity to reduce costs in the simple easy ways to do that. The next piece that we recommend is benchmarking your performance with a neighbour's energy rating. So Neighbours Energy stands for the National Australian Built Environment Rating System. This is a critical tool for supporting office-based businesses um, and indeed commercial buildings generally with reducing their energy consumption because it's because disclosure of energy consumption with a neighbour's energy rating enables businesses to not only see how they're doing in terms of their energy consumption, are we getting a high star rating, but it also gives 
uh, neighbours rated businesses a comparison with where they sit with similar organisations. Importantly, uh, Officers that have been rated for a 10 year period have on average saved 40% in energy over that 10 year period. And that's because the neighbor's energy rating has enabled them to see where they're using opportunity, where they're using energy and finding that opportunity for reduction. Which brings us to our third piece. So once you start with what can, what can be seen and you've benchmark your performance with a neighbor's energy rating. We talk about adopting energy management as a discipline with an energy management system. So really importantly, energy management systems, whilst they have international standards, which aren't necessary, they're probably a bit of an overkill for most office-based businesses, but in principle, what they enable businesses, businesses to do is realise continuous improvement. And indeed, Energy auditing is a key part of that because it enables you to identify the opportunities. Simply put, an energy management system like an environmental management system or a quality management system requires a few things. And that's an energy strategy and policy from which the organisation can say, this is our target, so our policy is we're supporting net zero. Here's our strategy for getting there, which includes things like objectives and action plans. And that is all a planning stage. You then move to doing that, which is delivering the action plans and the energy reductions and emissions reductions opportunities. You then check that you've, what you've done is actually achieving the goals that you made. So those, what were the targets that aligned with those action plans? And then afterwards you act, which is learning from your review. And it's a continuous process that enables businesses and other organisations to continue to achieve improvements in energy performance. And energy audits are very key to doing that because they identify the opportunities that will enable your business to realise those savings. So simply put, What's the role of energy audits in supporting energy management initiatives? Well, I would assume that a lot of you have a rough idea of what an energy audit is, which is relatively simple. An energy audit enables a business to identify opportunities for reducing energy and emissions. There is an international standard for energy auditing, and there is an Australian standard called AS3598. Now, there are three types of energy audits that sit underneath that Australian standard. Type one is a basic energy audit. Type two is a detailed energy audit. And type three is a precision subsystem audit. The reality is, is in an office-based building, you are highly unlikely to need a precision subsystem audit. So a type three, unless you are running the whole building and have complicated plant equipment in the basement. And by that, we mean old boilers, old heating, ventilation and cooling equipment. Most office-based businesses, and indeed, if you're a tenancy, a type one audit will support you with making quick, easy wins straight away, whereas a type two audit will enable you to make deep reductions in your energy consumption. So what exactly are these three different types? Well, type one focuses on highlighting indicative savings. So effectively, an auditor will come in, and it does involve you getting an energy auditor to come to your site, will look at your energy bills and the data and information that's provided on your energy bills and will also do a walk around site to identify obvious things. So that's some of those things you might be able to identify yourself, but some of those things you won't be able to. And effectively, with a type one energy audit, which is a basic energy audit, the energy auditor will come in and go, cool, I can look at this straight away. You need to upgrade your lights. Your HVAC system is, which is your heating, ventilation and cooling system, is 20 years old. If you upgraded that to a model with a higher star rating, because there are star ratings for certain types of equipment in Australia, you will then be able to reduce your energy consumption by X amount. It's really important to note that a type one basic energy audit, audit is useful for identifying investment opportunities that have short payback periods of less than two years. So just looking at things like LED lighting upgrades and simple upgrades to equipment that's quite old. What differs between a type one and a type two 
is that a type two goes into a lot more detail and looks at the specific different areas in which your business is using energy. So it will review lighting, it'll review space heating and cooling through your HVAC system, it'll review your hot water system, it will review the building envelope, so we're talking about insulation and, and glazing, and look at these different opportunities and and effectively quantify what the opportunity is to reduce your energy consumption. If your business is serious about reducing energy consumption, a type two energy audit is the way to go. But if you are looking to build the business case and the understanding internally, paying for a type one energy audit initially will enable you to realize some quick wins and get guidance from a, an individual that specialises in this area and build that case internally to later take on a type two, which will enable you to deep dive. And this again, really key to thinking about energy management as a discipline and energy management systems. You can start with the type one, achieve the quick wins, but you wanna realise that continuous improvement. So if you come back and do the type two and actually deep dive into the different uh, different areas that your business is using energy, you'll be able to realise larger savings. Now, last but not least is a type three. So the difference for a type one and a type two compared with a type three is a type one and type two look at your whole building or facility or office, whereas a type three is looking at a particular subsystem or process within the building. Type three energy audits are typically used on manufacturing and industrial sites to look at very energy intensive processes to see where the opportunities are. But again, these can be used in commercial building settings like the buildings that your law firms sit because there could be complicated plant equipment in the basement or on the roof that is supplying the hot water services or the space heating and cooling services for the building. But really importantly, when you're thinking about what you as a business should be doing, if you reach out to an individual that supplies energy auditing advice, and you can find them by going to the EEC's website, ec.org.au forward slash members, and then you can do a search of who provides auditing, you'll find a bucket load of people that have been trained to adhere to the Australian standard, and you can work with them to get that type one energy audit in the first instance to get an idea of quick wins and opportunities and then you can deep dive later into a type two so for those of you that are in office tenancy so that are renting rather than owning it's probably worthwhile noting what the regular breakdown is in terms of energy consumption so in late 2020, we did some research with neighbours and uh, indeed City Switch, and we worked out where energy was being used. So generally speaking, if you compare the whole building versus the tenancies inside that, the base building, so we're talking about the heating and cooling for the space heating, the hot water systems, the lifts, the lighting in the common areas, all of that normally accounts for 50 to 60% of the energy consumption in a building with the tenancy's direct consumption being the remaining 40%. The graph that's currently on uh, the screen is demonstrating where that energy consumption goes. Now, from your perspective, if you are renting the office that you are sitting in, this is particularly important because this is what you have control over. So you pay for your lights and you pay for all of your office equipment. Lighting undoubtedly uses the most amount of energy. So switching to LED is the huge opportunity. The next biggest energy consumer is monitors. Now, really importantly, there is a program in Australia that has minimum energy performance standards for lots of different energy equipment, including monitors. So the minimum standard is just the minimum standard, but then we have a star rating system, which enables you to purchase the most energy efficient op option. And when you've got 100 or 2000 uh, monitors in your, in your office, it's really useful to think if we get the most energy efficient uh, monitor that's on the market, that's gonna reduce our energy consumption. The same principle with desktop computers and laptop, 
computers. A laptop computer typically uses about a third of a desktop computer. So if you're switching over, which I appreciate most people have done, but there are still some really old pieces. And indeed, things like printers and multifunctional devices. So I go to the next slide. When you're thinking about where are the opportunities, some printers use a ridiculous amount of energy. Now, we don't have a lot of printers, but definitely in a legal firm, you guys print a lot of stuff. So moving to an inkjet printer over a laser printer, which uses a lot of extra heat, can be really pertinent to reducing your energy consumption. Same thing, like broadly what's on this, and we will give you the, the slides after this, thinking about common opportunities within the office, Things like electric motors and pumps, not useful unless you own your building and you've got a lift, but the rest of this is all used. So there are really good opportunities. And if you get a type one energy audit, the type one energy audit is going to identify opportunities that use up at least 20% of your energy consumption. So that's definitely gonna be lighting as the number one most obvious. A type two is going to identify all opportunities that that use at least 10% of your energy consumption. So it'll go into a bit more detail and will effectively give you the payback period for these different upgrades. And by payback period, I mean, if you buy, uh, let's uh, simply put, if you take an upgrade for lighting and it costs $100,000 to achieve, but you make a financial saving on your electricity bill of $50,000 per annum, that means the payback period is two years. So the energy audit, whether it's a type one or a type two, will give you this information to support you with making financial uh, investment decisions. So with that in mind, I'm gonna pass back to Vic, who's gonna to talk to you about how you can boost the business case even further. Yes, thank you, Holly. Yep. So that um, goes right into the discussion that I'm going to have about how you can leverage the existing tax incentives that the government has available to invest in those energy equipment um, and energy upgrades that uh, might be identified through an energy audit or through looking around the office and, and realizing that, you know, equipment's outdated, might be time to bring it up for an upgrade right now is the time to do that because of these um, time limited uh, uh, government tax incentives that we have available. Um, so the government has had some kind of asset write off tax incentives available to small and medium businesses um, for a few years, but in 2020 they announced an expansion of the incentive and called it the temporary full expensing. So in the past it was called instant asset write-off and it was for smaller businesses um, and the assets had a certain threshold. Um, and in 2020 to help businesses recover from COVID um, and encourage them to invest in capital investments, um, they expanded this uh, tax incentive to allow for the immediate deduction of an asset of any cost. So it used to be capped at 150,000 and now <clears throat> it's an asset of any cost for any business um, with a turnover of up to $5 billion. So again, the asset threshold or the turnover threshold used to be 500 million. So this has expanded to basically encompass 99% um, of Australian businesses. Um, so if your business has a turnover of less than $5 billion, you are eligible to do this instant asset write off. Um, or sorry, the temporary full expensing. It's called temporary because as Holly mentioned before, it only lasts um, until the end of June, 2023. So only one more financial year and the asset needs to not only be purchased by then, but also installed ready for use by the 30th of June, 2023. So it is something that kind of needs to be taken action on sooner rather than later so that businesses can take advantage of the um, instant depreciation that they can get um, in that tax write-off for the financial year in which it was purchased. Um, and so the eligibility for uh, for the instant asset write-off, if you're under $50 million, um, new assets, secondhand assets, and asset improvements are all in included in, in the eligibility of the asset. And then if you're between 50 million and 5 billion, you can do the instant asset write-off, uh, sorry, the temporary full expensing for new assets and asset upgrades, um, but not for secondhand assets. 
Um, so just to give you a sense of, of how this is being used right now, um, a survey earlier this year showed a huge upsurge in capital investments from, from SMEs, which they noted were largely attributable to the tax incentives available to businesses that the government had introduced as a result of COVID, uh, the, the COVID recovery stimulus. Um, so businesses kind of indicates that they're taking the opportunity with these incentives to invest in some of these assets that might have been too expensive to do so earlier. And the, the business case might have been just a little bit too difficult um, because that, that payback period would have been too long or just didn't seem like the right time to invest in an, in an energy or asset upgrade. Um, doing the temporary full expensing and getting that full deduction in the first year can drastically improve the, the business case and the payback period for uh, for an asset investment. So as Holly mentioned, if you have something like an LED lighting upgrade, I know we keep hammering this home, but it really does use 80% less energy than traditional lighting. Um, and it's it's directly related to huge uh, cost savings. So it's just such low hanging fruit that if anyone hasn't done it yet, we're hoping that the one thing you take away from this conversation is that you should upgrade your lighting. <laughs> um, but if you saved $40,000 on a $100,000 upgrade and $40,000 in your energy savings, um, the investment would pay back in two and a half years. But if your um, business is, you know, $75 million in turnover, it, it would have a 30% corporate tax rate. So then you would get a 30% um, tax benefit from that investment. And then that would bring down the pay, payback period to um, from 2.5 years down to less than two years, like uh, one point seven, five years. So this is something that can be significantly important in not only um, reducing your emissions, but also reducing your ongoing operational cost and then allowing you to invest in in other uh, business growth initiatives that that might be important for um, for your long ongoing business operations. So it is something that we're really trying to to get the word out about. We are not tax advisors, we're not financial advisors, but we really just want to make sure that people understand the value of being able to use an asset um, incentive, a tax depreciation incentive like this, because a lot of energy upgrades that, you know, the slide that Holly showed earlier um, with all of the different equipment and like the, the energy savings that you can get from those upgrades, a lot of those are depreciating assets that this can be used for. And a lot of people don't realize that, that, you know, a solar panel, a battery, um, an air HVAC, air conditioning system, those are all depreciating assets that you can be investing in with this, um, as long as it's for your business, <laughs> um, with this instant uh, temporary full expensing. Um, so anyway, that pretty much wraps up our prepared remarks, and I know we've gone quite quite over, um, but just wanted to note that you can find these resources um, as well, so the tax guide, um, as well as the guide that Holly was talking about with the quick um, reference guide to energy audits on our energy briefing website, which Holly's going to put in the chat probably now. Um, and as well as some other materials that if you're just interested in learning more about what's going on in the energy industry, what's happening in the um, in the transition, it, what's happening in energy markets, we have um, news updates, we have a annual briefing that you can use to be able to understand the market and then be able to explain it to the other business decision makers um, in, in your organizations to help drive the um, that energy management is incredibly important in um, in kind of business decision making and, and emission reductions and, and climate action goals. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. Um, I just realized you probably couldn't see our faces very much for this, but anyway, uh, we'll stop there and ask for any questions. Excellent. Thank, thank, thank you very you much, much, guys. I could um, I could see you fine. That, that you, we, we can see you quite well. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. I think, um, yeah, a really great background, not just on, um, ha, you know, what's involved in in um, getting an energy order done, but why you would do one and what you can expect to get out of it. And um, it's really good news in terms of, you know, a bit of a window of opportunity to take advantage of, of that full expensing uh, tax concession, which, um, you know, really does make a lot you know, a lot of projects potentially even even more financially um, attractive as well as environmentally attractive as well. So thank you very much. So um, what I might do, um, so guys, if you would like to ask a question, we got, um, we've certainly got 15 minutes left in our hour, but we'll probably, if um, if Holly and Vicar are okay with it, um, 
keep going. We might formally sign off at one o'clock, but uh, feel free to stay on the line if you um, would like to continue discussion for a few more minutes after then. Um, if you do want to ask a question, if you um, if you could just raise your hand, um, and it's because at the moment I think you're all muted, and, and we might have to. Um, unmute you ourselves. So Kelvin might progressively just go through and unmute people as they raise their hand for questions and then um, Kelvin will um, know who he's unmuted and um, call on you. Um, but I, I can, if I can kick off with a, maybe just a couple of um, questions that occurred to me. Uh, the first one, um, the range of, like I don't know how long's a piece of string, but the, the, what could people expect for a, a type 1 audit and a type 2 audit in terms of range of costs? Is there any kind of way of kind of just saying, well, look, if your energy spends $10,000 then you can expect your energy audit maybe is, you know, it's going to be, it typically is, you know, 10% of, of an energy spend, an electricity spend or, or, or per square meter. Is there a way of kind of getting a sense of what that is? It'd probably be fair to say that uh, whilst we might think that offices and commercial buildings are relatively similar, they're not. There is great variability. So as an example, um, for a tenant, you shouldn't be covering uh, air conditioning services. The main base building should be covering that and the landlord will be covering those costs. However, lots of tenants have what we call supplementary HVAC, which is additional air conditioning in their offices that they themselves cover. Now, what percentage of energy consumption that could be of the individual tenants load can range from 2% of their energy consumption up to 80% of their energy consumption. And that's from neighbours' own data. So what that means is you've got huge variability in where the options are, but basically a type one energy audit enables an individual business to get some granular detail on breakdown of energy consumption for any end use that has a that is using 20% or more of the total site's energy consumption. So for most of you, which I imagine most of you would be tenants, lighting is definitely going to hit that. Now, the issue with a uh, audit is it's not going to go into plug load. It won't go into that. However, you will get an energy auditor saying, uh, you know, most of your energy consumption is from plug load, so your common opportunities are to buy more energy efficient, and by that I mean procure. So whenever your uh, workplace is getting new computers, which often happens every five or ten years, and well, computers probably a bit more regularly, but new screens, making sure that the procurement policy is arguing for that higher piece. When you're in a owner occupier office type situation, you would anticipate that you'll get quite detailed information on explicitly lighting and HVAC. So heating, ventilation and cooling, the space heating and cooling. And you will be able, even with a type one audit, be able to get, this is the age of your, uh, of your equipment. We know it's using roughly X amount of energy and I say roughly because it depends on the amount of data that you have available. So what is available to you right now, if you go onto your energy bill, you'll have daily energy consumption, but some offices uh, might for whatever reason, depending on who your retailer is, you might have hourly energy consumption. So the capacity for a auditor to support you with making decisions and to think about that payback, it, if they look at your profile of energy consumption, they can work out which pieces of equipment are using energy and they can go, that's actually a really high amount of energy consumption for your HVAC system. So if you upgraded this, even on a type one energy audit, they can estimate what the savings will be. If it's a type two energy audit, they'll go into a little bit more detail. So they can look into the specific, uh, the specific type of equipment and they can look into what the general load is because all of this information is available because we have minimum energy performance standards, which is a government program. So there's capacity to do calculations that are quite detailed. And the real difference between the type one and the type two is the type one will give you 
payback periods and investment guidance for anything that's using more than 20% of your energy consumption, whereas the type one will do it for anything that's using more than, sorry, type two will do it for anything that's using more than 10%. That's also the case uh, with the type three, but the type three is going to be looking at a specific subsystem and just the HVAC rather than every opportunity that you have available to you. So Richard, I appreciate that. Maybe didn't entirely answer the question, um, but it's, it's difficult. Yeah, look, I, th I think what I was trying to understand was not so much the cost of implementing the audit, but the cost of um, most practitioners probably need to get some sort of sign off in terms of um, procuring an energy audit. So they'd yeah. need to know, OK, well, I need a budget of $10,000, for example, to get um, my audit completed. Um, I imagine you can get some quotes without um, um, obligation to, to sort of kick that yes. process off as well. You most definitely can. So uh, again, if people go to ec.org.au forward slash members and then search for who provides auditing, typically speaking, and, and again, this really varies. So mm. if you are a small office or someone can come in and they can do a type one energy audit in an hour and then spend a couple of hours of doing desktop work. So it's all up a half a day job. So it's only going to cost you a couple of grand. If you are a much bigger uh, office and have much more people and much more space, it will end up costing more than that. The difference between the type one and the type two is that people will spend more time on site reviewing all of your equipment and they'll spend more time doing desktop work looking at the calculations. So broadly, it's really dependent on your size and we don't yeah. actually have good data on per square meter, it'll cost you X amount to do this, um, but it's pretty simple to get quotes. Pretty much everyone will happily give you a quote um, and we'd recommend you to go out, get a couple of quotes and see who's got the best opportunity. But if you are a smaller uh, legal firm, you could get a type one order for a few grand. Yeah, terrific. 